today. Uh, we have with us Tara Rutley, who is an ISS program scientist, or the associate associate program scientist, um, to tell us a little bit about uh, some work we saw going on yesterday in the Kibo Laboratory, where uh, flight engineer Aki Hoshide was setting up the aquatic habitat. Thanks so much for joining us, Tara. Hey, it's really good to be back. I love talking to you guys and sharing the science that's happening. And so, yeah, it sounds like the, uh, the uh, JAXA aquatic habitat is making its way on the station and, and the crew is assembling it. And I really think this is a really fun um, <coughs> facility for future investigations because it introduces a new type of, um, of physiological model in that's a fish. So right. the space station will get its first fish tank, <laughs> is so it, to speak. Is it basically like an aquarium? Or? Yeah, the way the hardware is set up <clears throat> is that it's a system of two aquariums and each one is about half a liter. And the system can support anywhere from eight to 12 type, uh, twelve uh, fish, if they're zebra fish or madaka fish. Those are the two types that will be studied here. Um, <clears throat> and our the uh, the system is basically kind of a lot like what you'd see on the ground in terms of keeping your fish healthy. You've got an uh, environmental control system that has a biological filter that filters out the waste. There is a lighting control system, an LED version uh, that gives night and day light, light and dark cycles. So the fish have cues because you don't get that okay. in space station. There's automatic feeders for the fish. And there's an oxygenation system that, that makes sure the fish get the oxygen in the water that they need too. So it's a nice big facility that'll be located in the uh, Kibo module of space station. Station. And um, I think the first set of fish are scheduled to go up uh, here in the fall on a Soyuz flight. Okay. So that's pretty exciting. And for some reason, I'm imagining this, you know, the little plastic bags that you carry home from a fair when you went to go fish. I'm probably yeah, not like that. Not though. exactly, right? Because space flight's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, these fish will go up in a small round container that will be uh, loaded, and they have um, membranes that allow uh, exchange of air for the fish loaded with water, um, and then launched up on a Soyuz, and then automatically inserted into the habitat. When this, uh, this piece of hardware gets inserted into the habitat, it will release the fish and fill the aquarium. So okay. it's pretty exciting, and um, you know, this isn't the first time that we've flown fish in space. Our JAXA colleagues have had a history of, of good experience with, especially zebrafish and madaka fish. They've flown in space. And that's what was going to be in, in yeah, this. Yes. Uh, particularly, they flew on the early space shuttle flights, the space lab flights, and mm -hmm. they were particularly looking at changes in the fish's vestibular system, or the system responsible for for balance, and that plays a big role in motion sickness. So uh, the longest that they've ever flown fish were 16 days on a shuttle flight. So what we're looking at now for space station is about a 90-day uh, flight. Um, so we want to be able to breed fish over three different generations. Wow. So the first set of fish will be born on the ground, launched into space, survive, ideally, uh, reproduce in space, so they'll have children, and then after that, uh, that generation will, will produce more fish that were pure space bred and, and uh, developed. So the ways, that, so the things that the scientists want to look at when we're talking about looking at these fish, why would you even want to do that? Longer exposure to space flight tells us more about something that might be applicable to the crew health. For example, you can get a good look at these particular fish's uh, muscle system, their skeletal system, and you know, crew on, on long duration space flights have a lot of changes in their muscle and their bone systems. And so we can get a little bit of information from how these fish develop and the longer t they stay um, as well through their bone and muscle. We also can look at uh, effects of radiation on these particular fish as well. And in fact, we may glean some uh, really interesting information about how they develop early development on, on, on space station because a lot of the way even we develop, everything that develops, every living organism has this response to gravity. They develop based based on this gravity vector. So it would be really interesting to see the development progression in a situation where you take that microgravity environment away. How will these fish turn out? So um, so, so I know the crew that gets these fish are excited. I've talked to them about it. They're, they're uh, anxious to get going on it. And it sounds like the, uh, the development is progressing along. And so um, the first set of experiments is going to be called Madaka osteoclast. And that will start in the fall when these fish go up. And osteoclast is a type of uh, cell that's very active in breaking down the bone. It's normal. Uh, in microgravity, there seems to be a process by which they uh, prevail and, and go kind of a little bit in hyperactive mode. As a result, you intend to break down more bone. So, uh, so the investigators will look at the activity of the osteoclasts in these fish after their long duration stay on microgravity. Okay. Well, a couple of things. You, said, you mentioned that 
going to be breeding them in the space station. Mm -hmm. I know, see, we brought up before and all on purpose uh, mice and uh, spiders and yep. butterflies, but have, have we done anything that we've had several generations of? Uh, no, nothing that's been this long term in terms of generational. We've sent up, um, th uh, actually, we've sent up seedlings. I think plants might be a good way okay. to, to, to think about it. And so one of the challenges of plant growth is to just get multi-generations of, you know, seed to seed formation. So, so this will be, I think, the longest going uh, investigation set in terms of generational producing of any living organisms. Yeah, so space. not only how the ones that started on Earth adapt to microgravity, but also the ones who have never experienced gravity at all. You got that right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Interesting. And um, let's see, you also said that I think that um, it's going to last 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives us a, a few crew that will be involved. Have yeah. they? Did they get a lot of special training for it, or is it just throw in some fish flakes? Or? You know, I think the training they get is specific to, uh, you know, injecting uh, the fish uh, into their home and then removing them when the investigation's over, as well as they may uh, add some flakes to the automatic feeder. But otherwise, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a see-through tank, so you, they can watch the activity these fish swim around. So it'd be interesting to see what their perspective is, behavior-wise, you know, what the crew thinks about having fish on orbit. <laughs> Well, and this may reveal my ignorance, but, um, you know, I guess we practice for spacewalks in water to simulate microgravity. The fish are already in water. Will it feel, I don't know, very different to them? Or is I guess we'll find out. Um, you know, the vestibular studies showed some changes in their inner ears. So there's definitely something going on in terms of their uh, physiolog physiology, I guess you could say. So... Um, so it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, how that manifests, and especially with that third generation. Um, you know, it's hard to say since we haven't gone that far before. Okay. And I guess I also read that this uh, could eventually be used for amphibians, possibly as well. Nothing yeah. planned for yep. that, but it could. Yeah, the tank could be is pretty versatile. Just, just imagine what you could put in your tank at home that could survive maybe frogs, right, or, or snails, or... Um, Eels, even I've seen. <laughs> I was just at the aquarium a few uh, a few days ago with my daughter, and we oh, were right. looking at fish. And I, I'm going, what could survive in that aquatic <laughs> habitat? I was wondering the same thing myself. So okay. who knows? We have a long time on space station. Just have so. a menagerie up there eventually. That's right. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for coming and talking You're with us. I welcome. really appreciate it. Hey, it's good to be here. Again, this was Tara Rutley, the associate program scientist for the space station, talking with us about the aquatic habitat that uh, astronaut Aki Hoshide put together yesterday on the space station inside the Kibo Laboratory.